Oh, good to see you. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for the introduction. Um, today, tonight, I'm going to talk about watercress. I, I, I don't remember coming up with the title that we gave you, Reflections on <laughs> Writing and Illustrating, but I think we, I just chose something as general as possible so that I could you know, figure out what I wanted to talk about later. Uh, I'm going to talk about watercress. Uh, watercress is a uh, picture book by Andrea Wang, illustrated by me. And uh, this year it won the Caldecott Medal from the American Library Association, uh, which is the award for the most distinguished picture book uh, of the year, awarded to the illustrator. It also, thank you. <laughs> it, <laughs> that's right. it also won uh, a Newbery Honor I should say Andrea won a Newbery honor uh, for her writing in the book. Uh, and the Newbery is awarded to the most distinguished book for children of the year. So that's an incredible honor. Um, and it won an award from the APALA. Um, that's the Asian Pacific Librarians Association um, in the picture book category. So it won that award too. So it's highly decorated. We're very very lucky and fortunate to have had um, such a great reception for this book. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about illustrating it, how I came to illustrate it, and um, how I went about doing that and what the book means to me. I'm going to start, though, by reading it to you because I'm going to guess that not everybody has read the book. And uh, so we'll start with, I'm going to actually get <clears throat> get my copy of the book and read it from the actual pages. <laughs> but it will be on the screen, too. Uh, so this is the half title, and it is Watercress by Andrea Wang, pictures by Jason Chin. We are in the old Pontiac, the red paint faded by years of glinting Ohio sun pelting rain and biting snow. The tops of the corn stalks make lines that zigzag across the horizon. Mom shouts, look, and the car comes to an abrupt jerking stop. Mom's eyes are as sharp as the tip of a dragon's claw. Dad's eyes grow wide. Watercress, they exclaim two voices heavy with memories. From the depths of the trunk, they unearth a brown paper bag, rusty scissors, and a longing for China. They haul us out of the back seat. We are told to untie our sneakers, peel off our socks, and roll up our jeans. We have to help them gather it. The water in the ditch is cold. It stings my ankles, and the mud squelches up between my toes. A car passes by, and I duck my head, hoping it's no one I know. My parents cut bunches of the small plant, long, stringy stems with leaves as round as coins. My big brother yanks watercress up by the handful, roots dripping dirty water onto my shirt and thrusts it close to my face. There are tiny snails clinging to the underside. I squirm away. The bag in my hands grows heavier and heavier with the weight of all the watercress. The paper is soaked, and I'm half afraid, half hopeful, that the bottom will split, sending all the plants back down into the muck. Finally, we load everything, the soggy bag, my sopping shirt, our sodden selves, into the car and head home. Our original destination is long forgotten, a memory of something unfinished. 
On the dinner table that night is a dish of watercress, glistening with garlicky oil and freckled with sesame seeds. The mud and the snails are long gone, but I still don't want to eat it, any of it. I only want to eat vegetables from the grocery store. Mom and Dad press me to try some. It is fresh, Dad says. It is free, Mom says. I shake my head. Free is bad. Free is hand-me-down clothes and roadside trash heap furniture. And now, dinner from a ditch. Mom sighs and disappears into her room, returning with an old photo. My family, she says, from before. We stare. Mom never talks about her China family. She points to a small boy as thin as a stem of watercress. My little brother, your uncle. We hold our breaths. Mom never told us what happened to him. During the Great Famine, she says, we ate anything we could find. But it was still not enough. I look from my uncle's hollow face to the watercress on the table, and I am ashamed of being ashamed of my family. I take a bite of the watercress and it bites me back with its spicy, peppery taste. It is delicate and slightly bitter, like mom's memories of home. Together, we eat it all and make a new memory of watercress. So that, oops, is watercress. Came to me from my editor. Um, he sent me this right here, the manuscript. Andrea had written it, um, I should say, I, based on a childhood memory. So it's, she calls it semi-autobiographical. And um, it, it took her eight years to write it. She wrote it first as a long form piece, then cut it down, then made it longer. It took a long time. It sat in a drawer for a while, all the time wrestling with this memory and like what it meant, this memory of picking the watercress by the side of the road. She grew up in Ohio, uh, the child of Chinese immigrants. And she felt out of place. No one else in her town was of Chinese heritage. And so she was the only person that looked like her. Her family was the only family that ate Chinese food. She didn't fit in. And um, I think this experience of having to pick the food by the side of the road um, made her feel that much more like an outsider. So she wrote this book to kind of deal with, uh, first it was just a personal essay, and then um, it became a picture book. My editor sent it to me and said, I, I think you're, you know, I'd like you to illustrate this. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so good. This is so powerful and it's, it's only 400, it says right here, 498 words. And yet it contains so many emotions, layers of difficult emotions. Um, and it's so beautifully written. But I'm afraid, <laughs> I'm afraid to illustrate it. I am nervous about trying to take this on uh, because it was so personal. But with my editor's encouragement and the fact that it was so good, it was kind of, I basically said to Neil, my editor, it's impossible to turn this down. It's um, something like this doesn't come, it's like once in a lifetime that something this good comes along. Um, so I took it on. And one of the first things that I thought about when I was reading it and 
trying to put myself into the shoes of the characters in the book, I thought about my father and a story that he had told us as we were growing up. He told us this story pretty, I don't know, not regularly, but we all, we, my brother and I knew this story. When he was in first grade, I'm sorry, I should back up, my father's of Chinese descent too, so he's a child of Chinese immigrants. Um, so he was growing up in the 50s in Delaware, and um, he went to school, and I think it was first grade, and the teacher said, what, what um, did everybody have for breakfast? So it's a like, kind of conversation starter. And they all went around the circle, and everyone said toast and cereal and eggs or whatever. And he said, nook byung. And everybody said, what's that? And there was like giggles. And he's like, I, I don't know how to explain it. English wasn't his first language. He didn't have the words to explain what nook byung was. And he was so embarrassed that he came home from school that day he went straight to my grandmother and said, I never want Chinese food ever again, uh, or I never want Chinese breakfast ever again. Um, and, and she understood and said, okay, you know, this is clearly so upsetting to you. Um, and I thought of that, and I thought of how, um, what a tragedy that is. What a tragedy it was for my father to be utterly ashamed of his family, of his heritage, of the food that he ate, uh, and embarrassed, and what kind of mark that puts on a kid. Uh, what kind of, you know, it happened to Andrea, it happened to my father. And so I think um, I thought about that a lot when I was making this book. And we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. I met Andrea early on in the process, and she shared her, like, the backstory, her family's story with me. Now, a lot of people don't uh, know this, but it's not normal for a, an illustrator and an author to meet each other. The text is done, and then it comes to me. And editors, kind of the unwritten rule of editors is keep the illustrator and the, and the author as far apart as possible. <laughs> because. You know, ideally, you have two passionate artists involved in this project, and if they don't agree, <laughs> you're going to have some problems, right? So, um, uh, you know, it's typical. Um, it's not typical for the author and the illustrator to meet. But uh, early on, I think because this was such a personal project, Neil introduced Andrea and I. We met for lunch, and then we had some phone calls afterwards. She told me the story of her family, how they came to America, um, and uh, all, all the details that kind of went in, in um, you know, that, that were behind this story. Uh, and these are some photos of her, of her family. The woman in the center is her grandmother, and the young girl on the right is her mother. Um, and these were taken in China and Taiwan. They, uh, were originally from China, moved to Taiwan, and then to America. And I talked about my father and his stories, and here are some of my family photos, or my father's family photos. Uh, my grandfather has got the sunglasses, well, that uh, is under the umbrella there, the sunglasses. My father is the boy on the lower left with the red jacket, um, and he's the oldest of four siblings. Um, so that was the beginning of my research process. Okay. Um, and typically, for me as an illustrator, research is my way into a book. So um, in, in, the, uh, in this case, it was um, trying to figure out, the goal was to try and put myself in the shoes of the characters. And doing research um, and learning Andrea's story helped me to do that. But also having to doing research um, uh, into the history and the context and the time that they were living in was very important. Um, as was looking at corn. <laughs> There's a lot of corn in the book, and of course, I have to I had to illustrate this corn, and I had to learn what it looked like. So I went and painted corn. Um, there's no better way to learn what something looks like than to look at it. 
It's pretty straightforward. It's not always easy. It takes time. Um, so I spent a week painting corn, you know, one painting every day to get a feel for this plant that was going to be so important um, to the book. And as I was painting, it occurred to me that corn and bamboo are very similar plants. They're both grasses. They both have the segmented stalks. So the form um, of the two plants is similar. And they are also iconic plants of the respective cultures of the Americas and China. So that's where this illustration came from. That was kind of one of the first ideas that, that all the illustrations in this book sprang from. You have the corn on one side fading and merging into the bamboo, um, taking you from the present to the past. And that's where this illustration came from. Now, I also mentioned I had to learn about the history, and especially the history of the famine in China. So the Great Famine took place between 1958 and 1962, uh, roughly. There's some debate about, I guess, about when it started and when it ended exactly, but it's more or less the years right around 1960. Um, it led to more than 30 million deaths. And um, when I was learning about it and researching, actually I had taken Chinese history courses in college, so I was relearning. Um, I, I found um, some testimonials. The Memory Project is videotaped testimonials of survivors of the famine and Forgotten Voices um, is an oral history interviews with survivors of the famine. And um, Tombstone is, is another comprehensive overview of uh, the, the famine written by a, a really um, dedicated historian. Um, but it was the testimonials that really helped me put myself into the shoes of these characters. And because I wanted this to feel real, to have authenticity, um, I guess I always want my books to have authenticity. It was important to me to, to choose a place to, to set the illustrations and not set it in China as a whole. China is a huge place with a lot of diverse um, uh, landscapes and cultures. Uh, I chose to set it in Sichuan. I chose Sichuan because bamboo grows there. Bamboo doesn't grow everywhere in China. Um, because the famine was pretty tough there. It was one of the hardest hit provinces. Um, and it just so happens that Andrea's mother was born in Sichuan. So all these things came together to make that the place to set the book. And that brought me to the Harvard Yenching Library. Actually, at Andrea's suggestion. Uh, this is the Ch Asian Studies Library at Harvard, and a very generous librarian there, uh, Mr. Ma, took me down into the stacks and helped me find photographs, or a book, this one specific book of photographs of Sichu Sichuanese architecture. A lot of what's in Sichuan today, what you find photographs of, has been rebuilt or is modern architecture. I needed architecture from that period. And I had a specific, um, I had a specific um, you know, kind of class of people. You know, these, this family made it out of China. They couldn't be peasants. So I couldn't have like, them living in peasant housing. Um, but they were not the elite. Um, and, and, you know, times were tough for them during the famine, so it had to be right kind of middle class housing. So Mr. Ma helped me find these photographs, um, and here they are. And it was very lucky because it, this book was all written in Chinese, and I can't read Chinese, so I had to have, you know, I couldn't have done it without his help. Um, and then on my way out, I went to the Peabody Essex Museum. This is a museum in Salem, Massachusetts, and they have a Chinese house in the museum. Now, traditional Chinese houses are um, what they call suhuyuan houses. Um, they're courtyard-style houses. And this uh, 
type of house is found throughout China with regional variations. This particular one was from Anhui province, which is different than the houses from Sichuan. But in their museum, they had artifacts that would have been in, in my setting for the book. Um, and they were from the right time period. So I had, it was a very specific time period in China, right after the um, communist government was founded. Um, and a lot of things were changing. Clothing was changing. Um, for example. And so I had all these artifacts. And you can see here uh, how the photograph of this village made it uh, into this illustration. And you can see here how the artifacts from the museum made it into this illustration. Of course, I, have to, I had to develop the, the character. Um, the characters. So after I read the book, I started drawing and trying to explore what the faces would look like, what the characters would look like. Look like. The father had glasses from the from the start. Uh, not sure why, but he had to have glasses. <laughs> like it just some things come to you right away, and you know that that's what you want. Sometimes you have to explore. Like what's what's what are the haircuts going to be like? Um, what kind of clothing is she going to wear? What are her shoes going to be like? And what kind of, oh, here's an example of um, a character design. After I was very happy with, you know, kind of the costume and everything that I wanted, I'd make an illustration just showing what color everything was so that as I illustrate the book, I don't, I can be consistent. I don't make mistakes and accidentally put a, a gray shirt on him in one picture and a blue shirt in the other because um, I, sometimes forget these things. Um, I also explored different styles. I tried doing some brush painting, some watercolor on this uh, textured paper, some pastel. I really liked the pastel and did illustrations, uh, several illustrations in pastel. Um, but I ran into some technical challenges with the medium. And um, something kept pulling at me, you know, nagging at me, saying, you got to use the brush because the brush is so important to Chinese culture. Um, and I started looking at Chinese bamboo and landscape paintings. And I realized, yeah, I have to go back to watercolor, which is what I usually do, uh, the medium I usually use. So I looked at the Chinese, oh, but I was still hanging on to the pastel. I was like, well, maybe I can do some in watercolor and some in pastel. You know, the ones in America will be pastel, and then the scene set in China will be watercolor. It didn't really work out. Um, but then I did this one, and it, <coughs> excuse me, and, and this was it. Um, I will say that in Chinese painting, it's, it's a very different approach to, than Western painting. When Chinese bamboo painters, <coughs> excuse me, um, when Chinese bamboo painters paint the bamboo, each leaf is done with a single stroke of the brush. And you can see here, I tried to incorporate some of that into my painting of the corn. Um, and oh, if you use a lighter, the Chinese bamboo painter will, will use a lighter um, color or less ink to show bamboo that's farther away. And that's also done, done with the corn here. Um, also, Chinese landscape painters will use um, that kind of soft edge and lighter colors to show clouds. And I felt like that gave um, those pictures a very dreamlike effect. Uh, and it's something I wanted to bring into my illustrations. So you can see in the background there, the corn is very soft and, and, and washed out. Um, and that dreamlike effect, I thought, Par uh, parallel went well with the theme of memory that runs throughout the book. Um, and then finally, in, there's uh, some dry brush technique that Chinese painters use. Western painters use this too. It's not, it's not unique to Chinese painting. But you can see dry brushes when you take uh, watercolor and use very little water so your brush is drier. And then as you uh, make a mark, the hair of the brush um, leaves a texture. 
Um, so you get kind of a more scratchy mark, if you will. Um, and I incorporated that into the, the, uh, paint, the painting of the, the vegetation and the, the reeds down or in the grasses at the, the base of the bamboo. So you could see the stroke of the brush. I also did it in the hair of the characters. When I make a book, I always plan it out first. So I, what I showed you there was kind of like development of ideas and medium and style and, and stuff like that. But there's also the aspect of the narrative in a picture book, that the pictures have to carry the narrative. And I use storyboards and small drawings to plan out what picture will go in, um, on each page and the sequence so that that narrative flows well. Um, so this are, these are called thumbnail illustrations, and there's, you can see there are different ones for each page. Um, you can see, um, so I did page one, and then did page one again, because I didn't like it. Did page four or five, like six times, five times, something like that. Um, so doing small drawings, the thumbnails, allows me to do um, them quickly and go through multiple ideas in you know, a matter of minutes, in a 20 minutes. You can do five different ideas, something like that. And more storyboards. <clears throat> and then sometimes one illustration, you know, I'll have, I'll try out many different ideas for the one image and pick which one I like the best. I have here the book dummy. When I'm happy with the storyboards, I'll do larger drawings and put them together into a book dummy or a dummy book. And this allows me to read it through as if it were a real tech, uh, printed book and turn the pages. The page turn in a picture book is uh, a, a critical part of the experience of reading the book. Seeing a picture for the time it takes you to read the text on that page and then the anticipation and reveal of the next page is a really important aspect. And uh, picture book creators, uh, myself included, pay very close attention to what is revealed each time you turn the page and how that interacts with the text. Uh, where do you break the text so that it in, uh, entices the reader to turn the page, that it builds suspense, and then you reveal what's coming next. Um, so here are some photos of the book dummy that I just held up. <clears throat> and then here's the painting. I'll leave, end with the painting process. So I have a sketch from, I think this one is in the book dummy. Um, but then I refined it because I wasn't happy with that one. So I did a whole bunch of drawings, but I came up with this one, um, which I like the motion of it and the angle. So I refined it into a more careful drawing with, you know, the anatomy is, is more accurate and, and so forth. I put it on top of a light box and trace it onto watercolor paper and then tape it to a board. I, paint, I, I always tape everything to like a, a, board, a plywood board uh, because I like to be able to pick it up and move it as I'm painting. Uh, this is the drawing and then I lay in the watercolor. So it starts with lighter colors first. I always start with the, the bigger shapes and the lighter colors. And the, almost always, <laughs> the bigger shapes and the lighter colors. Um, that's the general rule. Uh, and you can see that on, along her arm and along his back and uh, her shoulder, um, there's white paper left. The white of the paper becomes the lightest white in the image. There's no white paint. Sometimes there is white paint that I go in and, and add. But in general, I try not to, to do that. Um, so you can see I fill in the smaller shapes of the, the corn. So that gives us the detail of, of the uh, leaves of the corn. And smaller and darker shapes as we go. And I think that is the last one. So that's how the painting comes together. This painting took probably two days to do. Um, sometimes painting take, paintings take 10 days to do. Uh, there's the whole book 
took me about a year to illustrate. Um, now, I also write and illustrate books. And when I do that, it takes me a year and a half or so to, to write and illustrate um, my books. But this is Watercress. This is how this one came together. And since it's been out, I've been able to, uh, well, a lot of people have read it because of the awards, but I've been able to read it to kids and go to schools. Um, and we've, I've, I've had been very, um, I was apprehensive at first, the first time I read it to, to classes, because this is not your typical fare for a picture book. It's about shame. I don't know any other picture books that are about shame. Maybe, I mean, maybe there are, but it's rare. It's about guilt. It's about loss, grief, very hard topics. Um, and so I was a little nervous, you know. I didn't know how kids would, would react. Um, the reception has been wonderful. Sometimes kids cry. Sometimes kids are sad. Um, and they want to know what happened to the uncle. Other times, kids want to share. They want to share, you know what, like, I foraged for food, too. Or I have hand-me-down clothes, too. More often than not, kids are interested in sharing. Um, one girl came up to me and just said, afterwards, she said, I'm new here. I was like, oh, where did you come from? Maryland. She's an immigrant. She was in a new school trying to fit in. It spoke to her. Um, she was not Chinese. This story crossed cultural, racial um, lines, I guess. You will. Um, and and it, actually, that moment was one of the more uh, the moments when I was most proud of this book. Um, and I'll say that we received a message from a teacher who, who wanted to share what her second grade student um, said about the book. The student said, this is a life lessons book. Be happy with what you have. Be proud of who you are. And I said, right? Be proud of who you are. And you know, I thought of my dad, right? So um, that's what this book means to me and the importance of this book to me and why it's important to me that it be in libraries and in the hands of children because children go through hard things. They deal with loss. They experience shame. And what I can't think of a better way to help a kid contextualize and understand those difficult emotions and maybe then go on to talk about them and share them and have a discussion about them and process them than a book. Um, and that's why I'm going to transition here. Um, that's why it makes me so upset when I hear of people banning books and taking them out of libraries. This book has not been banned as far as I know, thank goodness. Um, but other books have. Other books about difficult subjects, about people who are different, have been taken out of libraries specifically because they are about differences. They're about gay kids. They're about trans kids. They're about uh, black history. They're about difficult subjects that adults feel might make kids upset. And they, you know, I can't say that my book didn't make some kids upset. They, they were sad. It's a sad story. But that's OK. And it is so important that kids see themselves reflected in books, see their experiences reflected in books. Because how else? Not how else, because that is one really important way for them to know or to learn that they can be proud of who they are. Right? 
Um, and, and so we have to fight book bans with every tool we possess. We have to stand by our librarians and by our teachers. We have to support them and tell them that we support them having uh, books about all people in their libraries. It's, it's really, really critical um, that we do this because if not us, who, right? Um, so that's, well, I have, I, I, this is going on YouTube, so oh, for all the fans out there <laughs> and in here, um, I made a book, the book that came out before Watercrest was called Your Place in the Universe. And in this one, it's um, the, the storyline, um, or the reader, I should say, the reader is taken on a journey out, zooming out, looking at bigger and bigger things, like, the, like how big the Earth is, how big the solar system is, all the way out to the entire observable universe, and to describe the scale of that. Well, I made a companion to that, which is called the universe in you, and this one zooms in, and in where, where your place in the universe was about where we are, where do we fit in in the universe. This ends, ended up being about what we're made of and how we're connected to the entire universe um, by the very atoms and particles that make our body, because it turns out we're all made of the same stuff. If you look close enough, um, I, I would generalize a little bit and don't crit criticize me, internet, but there are just a handful of particles that make up ev all physical matter, all normal matter. It comes down to roughly four particles. <laughs> I know there's more than that, but... <laughs> That's the spoiler. <laughs> but yeah, so this one zooms into the very smallest stuff that we, that we know, about, know of. It's out in at the end of November. Yeah, so and right after Thanksgiving, it'll be in, in stores. So I can't wait to actually share it uh, and read it with people. Yeah. Well, thank you all very, very much. I appreciate you coming and inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and, and uh, thanks, thanks again.